Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Hopefully you enjoyed that Terran vs. Terran. I'm back here with EJK, and we're going to talk a little bit about Boreal Esports. I think a team that, to be entirely honest, a lot of people have not heard too much about. So what is Boreal Esports, EJK? It's, I believe, the largest organization in, like, esports organization in Canada. Uh, we don't do primarily StarCraft. I think we're known in other in other games, most notably for me personally, I, I saw uh, one of our Boreal players play Super Smash Bros. Mm -hmm. uh, he played the Wii U one in the Brawl as well. And he, mm -hmm. he did pretty well. Uh, I think it was at that Apex 2014 or yeah, something like that. Apex 2015. Or I mean 2015, yeah. 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 And then uh, we have a bunch of other games as well. I think we have a couple FPS teams, and then we also have some Hearthstone. What kind of prompted you to join Boreal Esports for StarCraft? Because I I think I it, I kind of struggle to think of like a lot of other StarCraft players on Boreal. It's definitely an up and coming team, and I I remember our the manager instinct approaching me and he was like, you should join Boreal Esports. And I was like, well, just send me a contract over and then we'll, I'll look over it. And mm -hmm. I, I usually just say that to every team that asks me because like 99% teams aren't going to send you anything or <laughs> yeah. it's going to be really shoddy or something. But he sends over this really well-written contract and I have a friend look it over and we agreed that it was a pretty good one. And we, after some negotiations, things, uh, where things went pretty well. It was a pretty smooth transition to Boreal Esports. And it is a it is a new, I guess, relatively new StarCraft team. They don't really have a big name for themselves. So part of, like another part of my job is also to help grow the team as well. I think that's equally as important as representing them in mm -hmm. StarCraft 2. What kind of advantages do you find being on the team? Uh, since it's, it sounds like you know the team is still growing. Just uh, practicing with teammates. Most no, most teams don't really practice custom games with each other. Mm -hmm. I think that's a big mistake. But there are uh, genuine reasons for not wanting to do that, and just helping each other out, supporting them as mm -hmm. fellow teammates. Of joining Boreal Esports has given me some more opportunities to go to different events. Like uh, I'm going to be going to LAN ETS. Yeah. 2015 this year so far. Yeah, that's awesome. I'm really glad that actually you brought up uh, the whole practicing thing because I want to ask you about that. And I'm really glad you brought up the custom game practice because that is actually one of my pet peeves is I always believe, you know, players should be practicing more custom games, more dedicated practice rather than just ladder you know kind of like doing both but knowing what percentage you're doing on each is important right so how what would you say is the breakdown of like your dedicated custom game practice versus just grinding on the ladder practice i guess right now i would say it's like 80 20 there aren't there aren't actually many people who will sit down and play a bunch of custom games with me and the ones that do play they aren't on every day so it may be like once or twice a week i might be able to play a bunch of games with them but other than that ladder for convenience is mm -hmm. a lot easier to do and i mean is it more just then that you are having trouble finding enough players who are able to play with you and you just kind of say well if i can't find anyone to play with then i'll go ladder or is it something else that's kind of kind of yeah like because if i'm playing during the day most people are at work or at school Mm -hmm. So, like, I just go and play ladder because there's going to be other people there, too. Uh, later in the day, though, sometimes, like, I'll look for, if I need help in a certain matchup or I want to practice something, I'll look for a bunch of people. If there's no one there, I might just practice with, like, it all depends on availability of who's there and who's not there. And I want to also ask you, you know, what do you feel has been your biggest result so far in StarCraft II? Uh, probably placing top 32 at Rebel Detroit because Bunny and Jadong also placed top 32 as well in that tournament. So I'm basically as good as them. I mean, confirmed. I, you, you got the same placement as Jadong and I know Jadong and Bunny are pretty good players. So awesome. You're, you're done with the show. You, you're disqualified. You've already broken out. Oh, uh, 
<laughs> I'm just, yeah, I'm just kidding. Of course, I'm just that. kidding. But uh, that is that is pretty awesome. So tell me a little bit of kind of like that experience and like how that tournament went for you. Uh, it was a cool experience. I the first couple rounds were easy, but then getting into the or like getting past the round of 32, I had to play versus Suppy, mm -hmm. and I kind of got a bit. Like, again, I got over eager and I had a small advantage in our last game when it was tied 1-1, but I just completely did something. I just, I tried, I attacked like before my Hellbat timing was ready. I actually attacked before it, thinking I could end the game and I ended up losing my entire force. It was cleaned up very, very easily. And then I had to play the rest of the game from very behind position and I ended up losing. Really quickly, I want to actually talk a bit about your Terran versus Protoss. Because you said, you know, you've made a lot of kind of improvements in uh, those weaknesses, that, that one weakness specifically that you mentioned about kind of over committing, and how you've improved a lot in it. Uh, how exactly is the matchup going for you right now, though? Uh, Ghost Viking is pretty hard. You have to hit a certain timing, and Protoss Harass is extremely difficult to stop, if not impossible, without spending way too many resources to stop just a war prism like... 10 turrets to stop a single war prism is just not worth it. So I try to play a more tempo-based game, and I like to use drops. I like to use aggressive strategies and try to like get an advantage so that when I do get into a Ghost Viking stage, the Protoss player won't they won't be, they won't have been sitting on their butts all day just gaining money and being able to like throw stuff away and the off to like it'll be a it feels I, like the as long as the tempo is in my favor, I think I, it's okay. Yeah, it sounds like you definitely are one that oh, kind of player that will enjoy some of the more scrappy games of Terran versus Protoss, where it's not just big armies kind of colliding and clashing. It's a lot of constant dropping and trading out units and making sure the Protoss player can't get to that comfortable, comfortable, you know, max out 200, 200 army in the super late game so that you won't have to deal with that kind of Ghost Viking micro as much, right? I wouldn't really call it scrappy. Mm -hmm. I would cons I can cons I think a better word to describe it would be clean, because there are times where being scrappy doesn't work against certain styles, and so you have to sit back and you have to hit a different timing, and it's if you hit that timing very cleanly, you don't necessarily have to like play the game out anymore. You can just straight up win there, mm -hmm. kind of thing. No, oh, cool. Well, I'm looking forward to seeing your Terran versus Protoss, and we will in just a second, guys. Don't go anywhere. We will be right back. It's game time! Terran versus Protoss. Welcome, everyone, to the Terran vs. Protoss. Once again, joined here by the one and only Zombie Grub. We're going to be jumping in and introducing the players in this Terran vs. Protoss as we spawn down here in the bottom left-hand corner on top of the Protoss. It is the red one. Emo Tap. Never right, as the blue Terran. DGK. JK. <laughs> Oopsie. <laughs> That's his alternate ID when he wants to be a G. Yeah, we want to be a part of Evil Geniuses whenever that contract exactly. comes around. Oh my god. E Evil Geniuses. E oh, wow. That's actually fantastic. That would be great. Because I think <laughs> about be like. Perfect. Yeah, it's it's like a Rooterdam where he like built in the team name uh -huh. into his name. Yes, it is. Good point. There have been a couple oh. others who have done something like that. I'm trying, I'm trying to think of some, but. I've always uh, been a fan of that. Well, I am always had the biggest ones, right? I am MVP. Oh, yeah. I am MVP. But his name wasn't, like, I am MVP. It was, like, Incredible Miracle MVP. It was, like, two separate things. Uh, Nicalities. Well, <laughs> we're into <laughs> a TVP now, so I guess our specialty, even though I've been playing a lot of random oh, lately, yeah. so I feel like I've not been learning... Of course, I've been learning, you know, of course, but I've just been learning more about what woes the other races <laughs> more than like, wow, like these gas times are really super important. Oh, yeah. I'm just like, F you does, man. <laughs> like, what are you even? Oh, my God. That's that reminds me so very much of something that QXC said. He said it like so perfectly. Uh, he was telling like he wasn't even like telling like the general public. He was saying specifically to like some other pros who were like balance finding. He said, try the race that you have the most complaints about. 
and you will realize, like, and you'll start to think, how the hell does that race ever win against me, ever? Yeah, <laughs> because exactly. Because you start to realize, like, those woes. Uh, so I, I can definitely sympathize a little bit with that, at least, like, from a third-person perspective. I am not <laughs> brave enough to go random. I've tried, but it's, oh. it's difficult. It's so difficult. Oh, it's so fun, though. Unless you're, like, just really bad at a certain race, which, uh, coincidentally, I am bad at Zerg. <laughs> Yeah. Well, one of the one of the difficulties about that is when you face a lot of cheese, and we already have a very very fast proxy bomb coming out from our pros player. And I want to note, EJK went for the CC first because it's a four player map. You can kind of sometimes get away with this, but uh, yeah, we're gonna be seeing a bit of cheese. What's so funny is that oh, oh, I'm at, I said funny, but I'm annoying. So now this pro <laughs> can go ahead and harass the command center uh, building SED. Hmm. Oh, it could, but it's choosing to get a scout. I feel like that's all the scout you really need. Really. Yeah, I mean, after seeing the CC first, like, there's no way your opponent could really have a gas. I mean, I guess technically you could have, like, not built a second barracks and gone for a gas kaiser or something weird like that. But it would be pretty atypical. But anyways. Yeah. They must have been <sighs> backing off. Uh, losing out on that opportunity. EJK going to be able to finish up that CC, but how much damage is he going to be taking to the uh, presumable Oracle? This would be the weirdest Phoenix, proxy Phoenix build if I if he does go for Phoenix. <laughs> Not going to happen. Uh, he's going to be able to have, what, five Marines just barely mm -hmm. for the Oracle? Uh, yeah. Maybe six. Maybe. I think by the time the Oracle actually moves in, he may have six, because I think his uh, third Marine should be finishing up. But EJK, I, oh, I like this already, because I want to note, he hasn't really scouted anything yet, but now he sees that there's no natural. His Marines are already sitting in the main base, just being ready for any kind of proxy Oracle potential. Yeah, six Oracles is very nice. You know, you can take on the Oracle no matter what, basically. Uh, now it's seven and eight, so that's even better. He is going to get a couple of the uh, the, the mule here and the SCV, uh, two SCVs, one was built in the bunker. So that could have been avoided. Uh, honestly, if you're afraid not to put the bunker on the high ground, you might consider lifting the main and the natural area mm -hmm. as well. Yeah, um, I'm actually. Here's kind of the thing about this is I I wonder if the Protoss player is pretty hard committed to this. Obviously, wow. like you went for your third pylon for the proxy stargate you're investing in these oracles you're getting a third oracle and he's doing good damage and he's keeping the or okay he was keeping the oracles alive he loses oh, one of them over there but i don't know if he's done enough damage to make this worth it versus a cc first yeah what's really interesting is that ejk is not res okay you can respond to this in a normal in a normal macro fashion and still survive but it's mm -hmm. it's going to be tight because two oracles are hopefully three had not lost mm -hmm. that one or actually yeah. four he's placing that third one they can bust through bunkers and if they don't bust through the mm -hmm. bunkers it's still killing so many scvs and like who cares like yeah. they can do that oh and they're super super good oh my god ejk getting the best of everything Damn. kills the stalker and the oracle it looks like the protos player was too busy keeping that oracle alive in the main base two kills for a stalker and an oracle i don't know if that was fully worth it but ejk doesn't know where the yeah. stargate lo oh. <laughs> looks like oh he thinks it's oh, on sucks. the left he thinks it's on the other side he's gonna lose that some really here. sucks yeah, he still can take on the Oracle. Ooh. I'm really surprised that Emotep allowed that to happen. Yeah, I, huh? That's I, yeah, a little bit unfortunate over there. EJK is probably going to lose all these Marines though, since the Stalkers have been warped in. But I want to note again, no natural expansion. And EJK even sees that with the SCV over there. I, this is one of those times where actually Terran players sometimes just start building that engineering bay at that natural just to delay it. Yeah, I feel like it would have been very worth building a stalker or something back home just to get rid of the scouting SCV. Uh, because, you know, I brought it up earlier, and I got lost in the follow through, but five racks were put down. Not two gas geysers, so obviously not a tech lab or a factory, just another two racks, which you usually don't see until you're, well, like, actually, you already have your starport. Then it's two racks, third CC or third CC, two racks. Mm -hmm. But having five racks this fast, you have so many Marines. This is like a, this is like a counter build. To what he scouted that it is going to be an all-in with oracles yeah this is actually going to work out beautifully and it's so funny because normally you end up seeing these kind of builds and you just see terran players saying oh god rush up to stim get up stim as fast as possible or like get up to medivacs as fast as possible but he's just going to have an overwhelming number of units not necessarily like the strongest units like his marines aren't going to have combat shields or stim or anything but he's going to have so many of them that this bunker bust in it's got to work those first time there's no second chance 
No, no, there isn't. No, imagine if there were three oracles with this. Now, they probably mm. die as well, but they, they might, like, make it so there's, like, half these amount of marines, and maybe mm -hmm. you can do something with that. But yeah. with this many marines, you don't have enough warp in. You don't have production. Yep, and really quickly want to note, Engineering Base started that natural expansion. No chance of a transition out of this, but quite frankly, I don't think there is a transition out of this. There's not even a Mothership Core, so EJK can, quite frankly, kill off this Stargate and just start walking across the map to do damage. Very interesting response. No? Yeah. Uh, very much so. And it's too bad that, like, Imhotep... I don't know when his scouting went down. <laughs> uh... Counter yeah. to the Marine, don't lose your oracles. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. But if he had been <laughs> able to scout that first oracle that EJK was responding to this with a five racks, I I feel like he might have been able to expand. Yeah. Like, it had to been, like, really quickly, like, a long time mm -hmm. ago in this game. Yeah, but yeah. But I'd, like, go back and look at the timings on that because mm -hmm. you do give up a lot going for five racks. You have a lot of tech of your own, so. Yeah. It's... I don't know. It's a really interesting question that I'm dying to actually ask EJK, so guys, don't go anywhere. We're going to be asking EJK that question and many more in the next segment. Don't go anywhere. Hopefully you guys enjoyed that Terran vs. Protoss. I'm now here with EJK, and we're going to be going over that game. Evan, what was going on in this game, man? <laughs> I, besides the salt, besides the salt, what was the analysis behind this game? Well, so in this game, the build that I did mm -hmm. was a command center first build. And normally, a proxy oracle kind of hard counters this if you don't scout it in time. But mm -hmm. I made my third racks before I made my orbital. So at this point, the oracle is coming. And it's a pretty fast oracle, too. It's not like it's mm -hmm. slow or anything. But I do have six marines. So I don't need to make an engineering bay to defend against this. Mm -hmm. I'm like already safe against this. Otherwise, I would just normally lose by only having five marines to fight against the oracle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, this is also important because I want to build up an army count as fast as possible. And so uh, by delaying the engineering bay and it just ha just like continually producing units. It's not great when he makes like the second oracle, but for the most part, it's safe as long as you, it's it's safe, it's safe. Mm -hmm. And then I add on these uh, two extra barracks right here to force out a lot more unit production. And although he's like mm -hmm. kind of getting some SCV kills, it is uh, it is just five raxes. I don't have the gas, so my economy is pretty fine because I have two mules and I'm only using minerals, so I'm really mm -hmm. making the most efficiency out of the limited workers I have by not investing in gas. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is a pretty f common follow-up to proxy Stargate plays, Got getting uh, get going for a gateway all-in, whether mm -hmm. it be Blink, Void Rays, or just Oracles. And he doesn't really do too well. I have all of these units, and because I have all of these units and I am going up to five Raxes, I have enough units to defend my mineral line without mm -hmm. actually making another turret. And I chose not to make another turret because I killed one of his oracles already. or So that's why I'm delaying the engineering bay and also moving out mm -hmm. like this. And I can, yeah, just move out like this. And even if he did warp, have units warped in, uh, they'd be stuck in a corner if they were warping into this area. Mm -hmm. So I'd just be able to pick them off while they're warping in. I think yeah. that's what happens right now, or... Oh, I'm looking for the Stargate. I didn't know where it was. Oh, yeah, yeah. He loses that Oracle again, which is kind of unfortunate. Mm -hmm. And these Marines... Again, I can do all of this, just kind of, like, lose them just to buy time, because I am making five Marines at once. Mm -hmm. And so, like, even though I've lost a lot of Marines, I just have... Like, this right here that's fighting his units, that's only half of my army, and his army isn't even big enough to deal with that right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I mean, delaying stim, normally like uh, traditional PVT logic kind of goes and says that until you have stim or at least uh, medevacs out, Protoss will basically have the map control because the stalkers can outrange and kind of kite your marines around and all that good stuff. So, I mean, are you concerned about that at all? That, like, the Protoss will be able to just kind of 
play really greedy behind all this? I know you do have like some scouting with the uh, the engineering bay and his natural expansion and everything, but well, it is a double-edged sword because mm -hmm. as great as five raxes are defensively, they're equally as great offensively as well. So if he were to take an expansion behind this, I would uh, I would see first that he doesn't have a lot of gateway units, so that he's doing something that's not involved with like doing a big home base all in like this. Mm -hmm. And I'd still be able to punish him as well because my army would be really big. I'd still have a command center faster than him. <coughs> and so, yeah, if you played greedy, I'd be able to counter with, like, that's a pretty large army that you would counter <laughs> yeah. with. Maybe not now, but eventually, and probably, like, with a couple marauders as well. Just kind of do a slightly delayed one, maybe like a combat shield push or something. Mm -hmm. Or if he's doing an all in, well, then I have a bunch of units that I can be defensive with as well. So it kind of just works in favor. It just kind of like works in my favor either way. Yeah. All right, cool. Well, do you have any other final thoughts about the game? No, not really. It's just kind of a small build order variation that mm -hmm. is able to win the game. <laughs> yeah, I really enjoyed that. And all you Terran players out there that are struggling with the uh, proxy oracles, well, Here's one more uh, tool in your tool belt that you can try and use. But with that being said, guys, we're going to be going back to the interview segments. Don't go anywhere. We will be right back.